So if you've been following our engine build videos, uh, you probably know that we're a big fan of cryogenic treating. Uh, we really like to cryotreat our really serious engine builds and particularly our race engine builds, mostly for uh, durability. Um, it can make a pretty huge difference in that regard. But uh, cryo can do a whole bunch of other things too. And I'm here at CTP Cryogenics. They're our cryogenic treatment supplier with Vincent Benami. He's the cryogenic expert, and he is going to educate you all on all the bits about cryogenics. So, how did cryogenics come to be? Um, so, initially, cryogenics, cold temperatures were noticed to make a, a huge effect on brass and bronze, softer metals. Uh, watchmakers uh, used to put their brass ingots into these uh, snow tundra and all the small parts used to machine better and as we were able to obviously compress gases and create liquid nitrogen uh, labs were experimenting especially in Germany with cryogenic treatment and uh, there was a big lab in the early 30s in Germany that was uh, developing cryogenic treatment and it eventually came to the USA. Now I heard for like motor applications, uh, it was kind of discovered accidentally like that too, that cylinder blocks and engine parts that were kept outside in the winter tended to last longer. Yeah, so Pierce Arrow did some sort back, like I said, in the teens. They used to keep their block, iron blocks outside, uh, then transferred over time. I mean, even there were even stories that BMW used to do that with their Brabham, you know, 1500 horsepower qualifying motors, turbocharged motors. Um, so yeah, as they noticed as blocks were kept outside over a few seasons of really cold temperatures that they machined better and also lasted longer. Now that cryogenics is kind of more of a science than some random kind of thing, um, <clears throat> basically it's an extension of the heat treating process, right? And, Correct. Uh, uh, from what I understand, it kind of helps convert uh, austenite into martensite, which is kind of a harder crystal structure. And that's where you get your uh, durability and abrasion resistance increases from, right? Uh, correct. You, you get a really good conversion of austenite to martensite. Uh, martensite is a larger grain, but also a tougher one. Uh, but what you also get is a shrinking of the atomic structure. So, you know, the BCC structures, um, when there's less gap between them, there's, there's less ener energy loss, uh, a better more toughness, but that's all the way down at the mm -hmm. atomic range, which transfers into the grain, the grain structure. Uh, the grain structure also shrinks, and you get much finer grains, and those finer grains tend to perform much better in, in wearability as well. Um, when you uh, cool something down to cryogenic uh, temperatures and then slowly bring it up, uh, in addition to the extension of the heat treating process, you also have a lot of stress relief going on in the part too, right? Correct. So stress relief can be done with heat as well, but it's not as thorough as you get with, uh, you get with cryogenics. So I think in the past, like a lot of the perception of cryogenics was um, it's, it's kind of like snake oil, but uh, a lot of people accept heat treating as a normal industrial process. But when you understand the, uh, what's actually going on, uh, the crowd treatment really isn't snake oil. It's just an, an addition to, um, like an additional, I guess, deep quench that's an extension of heat treating. Uh, correct. So your heat treating has to be 100% in order for the cryogenics to actually work really well. So that, that is the ABCs. You get really good heat treatment. We've gotten parts that were uh, heat treated poorly, uh, they, they were embrittled, and we couldn't fix that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's the first thing. Secondly, cryogenics is a finishing process, as you said. Um, what heat treat cannot do, because heat treat is an expand, heat works to expand, mm -hmm. cold works to contract. When we're contracting all those, all those elements inside the metal, what's it, unique also is that you have steels that are, you know, alloys, um, we actually distribute alloying elements even better. And so mm -hmm. why it, it's almost like you're mixing a cake and if you want all the ingredients to say taste as one, 
it's the emulsification and so when you're distributing the alloying elements inside the metal you're getting much more strength uh, and and spread out throughout the piece and what's unique is that when you take um, hardness testing on parts that have been cryogenically treated you notice that it's the same um, hardness throughout the, the part that you're testing and typically after heat treat you might drop a few points or go up a few points depending on where you where you're testing so it's kind of similar to tempering too right correct right so it does the same thing and i guess if you don't have the scientific background heat treating is kind of uh, like you bring the metal to what it's called a solid solution temperature and that's where the metal is uh, molecularly liquid even though it's still in the same shape and then you freeze it at that point by quenching and that um, that produces various effects by how it suspends all the different alloying elements in this uh, matrix and uh, cryogenics really is just an extension of that so it's not s snake oil it's actually pretty accepted science. Yeah, I mean, NASA has been using it for many, many years. It went deep underground in the United States with a lot of the aerospace industry. It was always on a need to know basis. We've been commercializing it since 1981, but there were companies that started even earlier than that. Um, like I said, all of the Luftwaffe's uh, engines were cryogenically, the Junkers motors were all cryogenically treated in the 30s. Now, I know for our use, if we make extensive use of uh, cryo treatment and WPC treatment in our builds, uh, we generally see up to about a 50% increase in um, uh, wear of the parts. Um, like some of our highly stressed race engines, um, a lot of them can only go like maybe half a season before they have to be refreshed. But um, you know, once we have all these treatments, they are even the most abusive um, condition engines can usually last the whole season. Uh, we've seen motors that actually last up to two seasons long, but n most anybody at the end of the season refreshes the motor. And what you notice when you open up the motor is there's a lot less to do with the motor. So you don't have to replace many parts. You're, you're checking tolerances and you notice that everything is a lot tighter than it would be otherwise. Yeah, we noticed that also. Um, so even though it's like an upfront cost in the long run, um, we feel like it's a good money saving thing. Well, we, we call this business a, a great ROI, return on investment. Uh, what you spend up front, you're really typically only spending 10% of the total savings a, a, as it's aggregated over time. Usually, um, as an engineer, I kind of think of cryo is being most effective on ferrous metals, but uh, it also works on non-ferrous metals too, right? Correct, it works great on copper, titanium, it works really well on obviously uh, stainless steel. We get a lot of parts out of stainless steel uh, that they want to stress, stress relief and also change the, the, the grain structure. What we hear from a lot of companies that may send us ingots to get machined. Mm -hmm. uh, stainless steel is notoriously very tough to machine. Mm -hmm. um, and what we tend to do is we cryogenically treat them and then they machine a lot e more easily. It depends we, what alloy is stainless, but some stainlesses machine okay and some are really like gummy. Yeah. How about uh, aluminum? So aluminum works really, really well. We do a lot of stress relief for the aerospace industry through cryogenic treatment. You don't convert austenite to martensite with aluminum, but you are refining the grain structure and spreading out the alloying elements, which has a great effect. So does cryogenics have um, uh, any effect on polymers and things like Kevlar or uh, musical instrument strings or musical instruments? Yeah, so we've treated in the past, um, we've done a lot of work with Kevlar and uh, you're seeing a, a great enhancement in Kevlar's strength, pull strength. Uh, we've done nylon, uh, believe it or not, uh, ladies hose lasts a lot longer, less runs. I know oh, that's really? funny, but, but uh, nylon has a lot of uses in a lot of other industries. Um, also, uh, carbon fiber, there's a lot of research on carbon fiber and the glue obviously that holds mm -hmm. carbon fiber, there's a lot less um, micro fissures, a lot stronger, more, more flexible. Wow, I did not know that at all. And I guess like one of the more common things that we do is uh, we bring things to be cryoed by you and then WPC treat it later. 
And it should always be uh, cryo first, then WPC, right? That is correct. And uh, well, what are the reasons for that? Our theory is is that once you cryogenically treat everything, the, the insides are, are, are changed. Uh, WPC works on the surface, where cryo really works on the surface, but also the inside. We want the WPC to actually be even better. So when you're WPCing, a cryogenically treated surface, the WPC is even more refined. And it's kind of more even across the surface, Absolutely, right? so you don't, you're not hitting soft spots, you're hitting the same, the same strength of metal all the way around. Um, and so they're kind of synergetic when they go together, I would guess, right? They yeah. both enhance each other's properties. Yeah, the WPC also strengthens the surface. It's, it's a micro shot peening, mm -hmm. but what WPC obviously does is it creates these micro dimples on the surface, which helps lubricity. If you're helping lubricity, especially in things like cams and gears, as they're spinning, they're throwing off oil, but if you leave a good oil film on them, they're, they're not going to create as much friction, therefore less heat, less wear. Mm -hmm. Cryogenics is almost a no-brainer, I feel like, especially if you're having a, like a serious engine with a lot of output. And for us, it's a pretty good uh, return on investment, and it's not that expensive considering the benefits you get. Absolutely. I mean, if you think about the average engine today is a well-built engine that's making a lot of horsepower, it's somewhere in the fifteen plus thousand dollar range. Considering what you spend on cryogenics at Moto IQ uh, or even WPC, it's a, the ROI is insane, especially because you're, you're now, a lot of people buy parts because they're better, they last longer. Why, why not add this to your regimen and, and actually know that it'll last a lot longer? It's not just a claim, it's, it's science. Now, I mean, my reason for using cryo is like extended wear, but you're saying there's some advantages in vibration and power production too. Absolutely, so when you're, when you're making a, a part more evenly hard uh, and it's spinning on, its, on a single axis, now you're throwing, you're not throwing different weight at different angles. And so you're, you're talking about a reduction in harmonics and we've seen this in engines. You're actually producing more horsepower with a cryogenically treated motor by way of the reduction in harmonics and vibrations, which either kills an engine or, or also robs it, robs it of its horsepower. I mean, we've noticed that a fully cryo engine sounds a little bit different sometimes. Yeah, and, that, and obviously that comes from the attenuation. It comes off of a part that's more evenly hard, so it rings bet differently. So we've covered how cryogenic treating really helps engine parts, but there's a lot more than engine parts that you could treat, like brake rotors, uh, the increase in abrasion resistance and the dimensional stability, like under heat. Especially on a cast iron rotor, you're improving its grain structure. What we noticed on, on, we've tested some race cars where one rotor on one side was cryogenically treated and the other one wasn't. And um, the rotor that was cryogenically treated actually ran cooler. So the heat find a way to, to escape much faster. And the transmissions parts, the improvement in fatigue strength, uh, the improvement in toughness, and the improvement in wear. Yes, with gears, there's a lot more toughness. A lot of people turbocharging cars today. Um, they're using stock internals on their gears. Um, cryogenics really helps with that. In addition to, of course, WPC, which also adds to the toughness. So you pretty much know the parts that uh, we send you in the car for treatment. Is there any parts that we overlook that you think we should do? I mean, we say anything that, that rubs and moves up and down or rotates should be cryogenically treated. Uh, obviously rear ends. Um, when we do uh, packages for transmissions, we tell people to send everything, including the clutch packs. Mm -hmm. um, and we tell people if you're gonna be sending the motor and you're gonna be sending some dry line parts, you might as well also send in your uh, pressure plate and your clutch, including your flywheel, because these are all these these all get balanced together when you're balancing a motor. So let's say my motor's all assembled, right, mm -hmm. and it's ready to go, and then I go, oh dang, uh, maybe I can get a cryo. Is it possible to stick a completely assembled engine with the seals and gaskets and everything into your uh, cryo system and maybe that's it'll work and not mess up all the 
like polymers and the seals and the gaskets and stuff? Yeah, so some polymers, it, it, as a side note, some polymers can last through the, the cryogenic process. Um, some of them actually turn, actually change phase into the glassy stage and they don't go back and become flexible again, so they're ruined. Uh, it all depends. No, we do not recommend that you send the entire motor in assembled. We want it disassembled. There are dissimilar metals. Sometimes your sleeves are iron and your uh, pistons are um, made out of other softer alloys such as aluminum. And so the expansion and contraction rates are different. And so uh, you, might have, you might have cracking issues. Uh, we've, we've done something similar in the past with much smaller motors, but it's not something we recommend. You'd be taking a chance. So there's a, quite a few other people in the country that um, do cryogenics. Why is CTP a better process than your competitors? So CTP has been around since 1981. It, it uh, got started by a, an MIT physicist. Um, what we do, and some people don't know that, we actually build our own machines. Uh, mm -hmm. We build them for large corporations. We sell them to very large corporations that want to do internal cryogenic treatment, mm -hmm. uh, or what they call uphill quenching. Um, we really know a lot about what it takes to cryogenically treat different alloys. There are different times, just like in heat treat, there isn't a book to tell you how to cryogenically treat. So we sometimes get phone calls from people who ask, you know, why are you uh, sometimes more expensive? What makes you different than anybody else? It's, it's all a knowledge base. Mm -hmm. and, um, and since there's nothing out there to tell you how to cryogenically treat, you absolutely have to know. And we find that even with uh, some of these alloys like 300M that are extensively used in the off-road industry, mm -hmm. um, we typically cryogenically treat and then we use a temper to lock everything in. But with 300M, what we found through research is if we temper afterwards, we're not getting the ultimate strength. So we don't temper 300M after cryogenic treatment. Um, there are a lot of cryogenic treaters out there from what we know and we're not poo-pooing anybody that don't have the capability to temper unless they're a heat treater themselves. Um, what I found actually uh, from our own personal experience is uh, when you have an engine with um, you know like uh, iron sleeves for instance an aluminum block we've had some bad experiences with other cryo treaters where they actually cause the block to crack and we've never had a single problem with your company. Yeah, so we take everything down really slow. Uh, the other thing that we do that, uh, and because we make our own machines and they're vacuum insulated, we're able to reach temperatures with liquid nitrogen that I don't think anybody else is able to if you're not running that kind of um, insulation. Uh, we hold things down at negative 312 to negative 315. There is a big difference in performance between negative 300 or just under and at negative 312. It takes a lot more liquid nitrogen, um, but because we're so efficient in the way that we run our machines, we're able to hold those temperatures. So I hope this answers a bunch of your questions about cryo treating, and I hope it gives you a lot of confidence about who we use for cryo treating in our builds. If you like this content, be sure to hit your likes, be sure to subscribe to our channel. And if you like our engine builds and you want us to build your engine, go to MotoIQ.com and click on the garage services link, fill it out and we'll get back to you. So until next time, uh, happy freezing. <laughs>